afternoon, Chef Jo. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon to uh, people watching on the live stream and even watching on the replay. So we have a very special discussion today about Chef Jo. No, uh, I met her in uh, PNG where I worked before, and now she's the uh, World Gourmet Award Female Chef of the Year. So we wanted to really understand how did that trans formation happen no if you're watching on the live stream now you can join our discussion and listen to the story the transformation story of chef uh chef joe and uh, my name is anton diaz founder of our awesome planet all right thank you right all right chef uh i'm so excited to talk to you maybe to give context okay. lang to a lot of people uh, watching here in Manila, uh, can you make an introduction in your like chef career and then we'll go to um, to how it all started. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jo, uh, Joanne C. Uh, most of you don't know me because I've never worked back home. But um, I'm Pinoy, based in Singapore. I'm actually um, currently the head chef of uh, Lola. In Singapore, it's a Mediterranean-inspired restaurant in Ansian Hill. Um, so it's a um, it's a very quaint, um, very um, like I would say like a stalwart when it comes to like the industry because it's been there for like nine years. So it's actually um, initially when we first started, it was a Spanish inclined, you know, like we serve like Spanish inclined cuisine, like more of um, tortillas, you know, the, the basic like patatas bravas. But um, over the years, uh, we've actually evolved the cuisine to be a bit more like encompassing, more of Mediterranean style. And even now after I joined, we've been actually also been um, um, evolving it into something that's more modern European, which is more in line with my um, style of uh, cooking. Okay. Um, I guess let me tell you a little bit about myself because, yeah, most of you don't know me. Um, I started out actually as a brand builder in PNG, and then I started cooking um, in 2010. So the first time I ever stepped foot in a kitchen was actually in 2010, no? That was still in Singapore. And then after that, I moved to um, New York to pursue um, further studies, formal education actually in culinary with um, the Culinary Institute of America. Um, so I stayed in New York for about four years. So I studied and then worked for a couple of years in um, a few restaurants there, um, namely Le Bernardin uh, by Eric Repair. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And yes, um, Cafe Bulud in New York City. Of course. Yeah, so that was like four years. And then I came back to Singapore after that, joined um, Restaurant Andre, which um, at that time was one of the top restaurants in Singapore. That was prior to uh, Michelin Pa in the World Gourmet Summit, I suppose. Um, so I joined that. I worked for four years as well in the restaurant. And then we closed the restaurant, as some of you might know, in 2018. And so I started traveling during that time. You know? So I took the time to um, enrich myself and expose myself to other types of cuisine. So at that point, it was, I suppose, um, Scandinavia which is where, which is what you would call the equivalent of Spain, I suppose, at that point in time when it comes to, you know, like being um, the, fr the front runner when it comes to uh, you know, uh, innovation in terms of um, cuisine and gastronomy. So I went there, I worked for a couple of restaurants, stage around, worked for free, restaurants like Noma, um, Rile, and um, Faviken in Sweden. So yeah, and so I did that. And then after that, came back to Singapore, started learning about Sardo, worked for a, a few months in a <laughs> Sardo bakery. I don't know if you know that. And then finally, yeah, joined Lola as head chef. All right. And uh, maybe Suguro, uh, let's, uh, before I'll ask you how, uh, how the journey was, um, can you give us a perspective? How big is this? Uh, or the perspective of the World Gourmet Awards, no? Uh, for a lot of people watching. We're not okay. familiar to see World, uh, World Gourmet Awards, oh. I think, here in Manila as well. Is this a Singapore thing lang and, uh, and the category that you won? Yes, it's been in Singapore for a long time, for as long as I can remember. Ever since I joined, 
the industry, no, it's been there. In fact, when I first joined, it was the premier, I think, like award giving body and um, organization that furthered um, the elevation and improvement in term when it comes to, you know, standards in hospitality and cuisine. So of course now there are a lot more, you know, like Michelin has come to Singapore. There is the 50 best. But it's still there, and I think it's still going strong, and they still do it annually, wherein, you know, they, of course, um, uh, acknowledge the people who are pushing the boundaries or trying to elevate the industry. And um, how, uh, what does it take to win this award? Wow, this is, uh, a lot of people are <laughs> proud of this uh, achievement. <laughs> a Filipino winning uh, against these <laughs> other ladies. I'm sure mm -hmm. I've looked at their credentials. They're really solid also. Yes, yes. Um, uh, as far as I know, so um, in terms of the nomination, so someone who is an industry expert or um, who is very attuned to, you know, like um, the developments in the industry here, they're the ones who would nominate and then they would look into, you know, the cuisine and then the chef. And there is like um, uh, a period where it's open to the public for voting. And then another um, stage wherein the experts, the industry experts decide based on what they know of the restaurant and the chef. I think some of them also call, um, visit the restaurant and um, have some interactions with the chef, of course, anonymously or, or something like that. And then they base it on that. There is also a lot of um, uh, weight given to, I think, the peers in the industry, other people who are not necessarily um, with WJS per se. Mm -hmm. but who are influencers and, you know, like movers when it comes to the, the, the F&B industry here. And uh, what does it mean for you winning this award? Um, it's definitely, of course, an honor to win it. And um, of, uh, of course, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone, friends, family, and people back home who I've never even met who supported me. Um, so, so thank you very much for that, for, you know, the, um, the trust and the belief. But um, for me, definitely it's an honor. And at the same time, a great motivator, of course, to do even better. Yes. Um, now, all right. And now I'm really interested, no? Because um, uh, I met you in uh, PNG. How? What does it take to jump from... You know, a corporate brand builder to getting into chef. What was it? Uh, ano ba to? Dream mo na to when you're starting to to get into the chef industry. Can you take us back to that decision when you decided you want to get into the uh, food industry? Mm, okay. Um. No, I. It was never really um part of my plan. Because um, growing up, I've always loved cooking. You know, like everything, all the memories that are still like so vivid in my mind, it, everything involves cooking or eating, but never actually have I thought about pursuing it as a career. And I don't think a lot of um, kids from my generation had, you know, like dreams to become a chef. Diba? In the olden days, kasi prior to the advent naman of um, food TV and so on, it was really not a very aspirational thing to do. Oh. But I enjoyed it. And then um, when I started working here, of course, I got um, a lot of opportunity to travel. And it was during that time um, going to, you know, like Western countries that were a little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to like um, areas like this, where I realized some people really make a career out of it. And it's actually, you know, like a viable career that you can actually pursue your passion on this front. And yeah, make a living and yeah, be happy at the same time. Oh, uh, pero hindi ba it's hard? Because I know you were. Uh, I know it's hard <laughs> from coming yes, from PNG yes. and then leaving that, mm -hmm. uh, studying again and starting from you know at the start, you know, of the restaurant chain. How how yes, hard was yes. it, and uh, what kept you going during those early days? Yeah, it was definitely hard because you know um, PNG is a really good company. Um, and it's always good to be able to walk with to work with all these remarkable people, you know, and you're all you know, pushing for something and you have a great deal of respect for the people you work with. 
and then suddenly you're going into something completely unknown to you. Uh-oh. Yes, that terrifies everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I really thought about it at that point. I think um, I did a lot of research into the industry prior to actually jumping into it. I remember I even Googled, you know, like top culinary schools in the world. Because when I started, it was uh-huh. um, I was a bit older, diba? I started yes. it after like um, seven, eight years of being in PNG. So I was almost like um, 30 when I went uh-huh. back to school. So I said, okay, I don't have the advantage of youth. So I have to work doubly hard mm-hmm. and make sure that, you know, I really make the right investment of my time. And, you know, of course, uh, culinary school is also not cheap and choose properly so yeah i went i asked around i asked for um materials from all these um schools overseas in singapore and of course these are schools right they would always like send you materials about Uh them so yeah i really did my research on that and then i finally um decided at that point because the cia was like hardly regarded as one of the top culinary schools in the world so that's why i decided to go there yeah, yeah, but a lot, a lot of research, a lot of vacillating. Also, is this the right move? I know I'm really passionate about it, but am I? I'm giving up a lot to yes. pursue this path. And so, uh, <clears throat> uh, and throughout your career, um, where did you really learn? Maybe you can share with us uh, what you learned from your mentors, from Eric Raper to Bulud to uh, Andre. Sino bang ano? Hmm. Sino pa talaga nag uh, to Ruseo or that mm. where you really learn uh, these are you know the top restaurants even Fabiken umabot ka ng Fabiken alayon oh, alayon <laughs> alayon na but they're close na rin di ba and uh, yes yes they're close oh, last year Noma. December and Noma so umabot ka in yeah. all those uh, you stage in all those places maybe can you share with us what you learned from your great mentors um I would say of all, because I worked in a lot of places, not just, you know, like whether it was um, work, work or stage. There are like mm-hmm. places that I only spent perhaps like a day or two also because, you know, I'm trying to maximize the time. I think the ones that I've learned the most are, well, Chef Andre, definitely, because I worked for him the longest. Um, he was, um, I've always considered him my mentor. He okay. was the one I suppose who helped me find my voice in terms of my style of cooking and then my focus. You know, what I love about his cuisine is how it's always very personal. You know, it's a, his cuisine is always, despite, of course, you know, like the trappings of fine dining, right? mm-hmm. of all these garnishes and flourishes and the presentation is, of course, you know, at the core of it, it's food that's from the heart. Okay. You know, it has a very personal connection to him, whatever he puts on the plate. So I learned a lot from that. And that's an approach that is, of course, like very important to me as well. No? Um, another person is um, Chef Repair, Chef Eric Repair from uh, Le Brunner Den in New York. Primarily because I was, when I was working there, I was always, um, I couldn't believe that we did fine dining for about 350 covers a day. A day? Like fine dining, that's a lot. You know, oh. considering the amount of work that goes into, you know, every single dish. Because where we were was um, on um, 50th, 56th, was it? And um, between 6th and 5th Avenue. So it was close to the theater district. So we had mm-hmm. three seatings, like pre-theater, you know, like, and then a mid-seating, and then another one pass. So we did three at night. And then we also had, like, a lunch service. So in total, it's about that much. But, yeah, from him, I actually learned how to focus you know you have to know Mm -hmm. what you're about and make sure that you stay true to that so for them it's fish it's seafood you know they know that they're all about seafood and fish is always going to be the star of the plate Mm -hmm. so everything that every decision that they make is based on that and that's why i think they can afford to do so many covers because as long as they protect that and they stay true to that, everything else is will just fall into place. You know, you don't have to worry mm-hmm. about it so much. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. another. Yeah. Yeah. So those two, I suppose, are the, are the are major the, influences. Mm, major okay. influences. Now, um, 
maybe let's talk about current no um meaning uh, a lot of uh, there's still a debate is fine dining dead and you know what, what will happen to this industry and you're in singapore you've probably seen what's happening after the uh, pandemic i'm not sure you guys are still locked down also so um what do you think uh will in the I think in this industry of fine dining or, um, you know, the restaurant, uh, oh. what will happen in the post-pandemic world? And um, and because uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, culinary students, are trying to enter or afraid to enter, you know, um, and they wanted to know what's what, what do you think will happen in this space? Um, even mm. just in Singapore or in, I, I, I'm sure you have a lot of network already uh, talking about this. Hmm. Okay. Okay. No, actually, here we're still pseudo. We're we're at this phase called heightened alert because there has been an increase in the number of cases. So there's no dine in. So everyone is doing um, takeout at the moment. Um, but if everything improves, it's going to be opened up in, I think, the 14th of June. We don't know yet what the conditions or the terms are, whether it's going to be reduced number of groups or like maybe two per group or whatever. But if, yeah, so we're scheduled to open around that time, no? But yeah, it, this is a question, I suppose, that everyone is trying to figure out right now, you know, what is the, what's going to happen? I personally think it doesn't mean the end of fine dining. In fact, what we observed happened during that time that no one traveled or um, was that the fine dining places did really well because mm. money that would otherwise be spent traveling mm -hmm. is used to treat yourself like here. So you travel with your taste buds, you know, you go to France, you yes. go to like a really good fine dining restaurant that specializes in French cuisine or you go to, you know, so, so that's what people did. And um, in fact, a lot of people got into this space as well, not just in terms of actually making the food, but also, you know, like um, reviewing restaurants, uh -oh. um, hawker centers, because yeah, that was a big, uh, there was a boom during that time. Of course, business overall, it's not, as good as it used to because of social distancing, you can only do a certain number of covers versus before, you know, mm -hmm. you can do do easily double that. But people were spending, yes, people were spending locally. So it is a big boom to domestic um, F&B. Okay. And uh, I wanted to get your thoughts because a lot of people are using this pandemic uh, to reinvent themselves. No, um, mm. <laughs> Maybe they're working corporate now. They want to get into the industry. What do you think uh, are the... If you enter the industry now, what are the three skills maybe or certain mindsets that you need to have entering in the industry and any tips for them uh, if they want to enter now? Hmm. Okay. They want to enter now. I think um, if we're talking about um, the landscape being the Philippines, I think Filipinos have an inher inherent advantage, you know, because we're naturally maabilidad and very oh, resourceful oh, yes. oh, because yeah. of the way we were raised and the realities <laughs> of our, you know. <laughs> so I think that helps us a lot in times like this because we're able to pivot and, you know, like easily adapt to the changes. Uh -uh. So that's one thing, you know. So, um, Looking for opportunities where no one else can see that is a skill, I don't know, that we have. So I think that is something that will really work to our advantage in this case. No? Um, but I think we also need to, whoever is interested in going to it, will really need to do a lot of their homework, actually, in terms of, mm -hmm. okay, what is the need in the market? Is there someone who's already fulfilling that need? Do I have the right to win versus this this person or you know like this um, restaurant who's already in that space? Mm -hmm. Things like this, like more of a you know like a, a strategy standpoint, and of course you're uh, at the core of it. Your product has to be good. You, know? okay. you can't really you know market anything that's not marketable in the first place. So it's it's that. So focus first on getting that right, and then yeah. What what the happened in time. Singapore? Uh, did uh, a lot of people lay, lay off employees, or what happened uh, in the restaurant industry? Um, a lot of the expats left. 
because of course, like things they they don't necessarily have to be located here to do certain things and of course maybe familial responsibilities as well overseas uh -oh. yes um but the government actually released a budget to support certain industries that were hardest hit by okay. the pandemic so like you know like um rent support uh, or encouragement for um you know rent reduction um job support scheme so to a certain extent, it's not as bad, I would say. Okay. Yeah, because there's that. Especially if um, you were a local, a certain percentage of your salary was covered by the government during that period of um, uh, circuit breaker when we were closed. No, uh -oh. and uh, you know, I'm wondering, no, uh, have you applied anything you learned in PNG, or you have to redo everything again when you started in the uh, food industry? No, 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 constantly, but okay, like this. I realized that what I learned from BNG is mostly um, management and strategy, brand building, yes. and things like this. So now I'm able to apply it. But at the onset, when you're starting out as a commi, as a line uh -oh. cook, of course, it's, <laughs> it's really more important to build up your, your cooking skills, your foundation, your techniques, your basic, right? So it doesn't uh -huh. come into play at that point. Maybe a cer certain things like, prioritization working smart things like that but it more it comes out more you rely on it more as you go up mm -hmm. and assume positions of management the thing is with i suppose like the industry is there's a big gap from for example the time you are sous chef and then the time that you become a head chef uh -oh. because there are certain things that are not necessarily cooking related that you have to excel at once you become a head chef right? mm -hmm. so if you have that corporate background i suppose you can use that to you know like um give you like a leg up when you once you reach that level mm -hmm. so that's yes. what happened to me yes yes and um siguro, um just looking back at your career no what were the three things, Siguro, that really helped you get to where you are today? Um, parang ang bilis sobra, di ba? From the time that you left into getting to the head chef. Don't you think it's so fast? I, I understand uh, you come at okay. it late also, and then you kind of yeah. hack. Hindi naman hack, Siguro. Uh, I mean, intelligent about how to get uh, you know, to the top of the industry. Maybe you can just share lang uh, what really mm. worked for you. Um to getting to where you are now uh, and, mm. you know, winning that uh, prestige, uh, prestigious award, no? Female yeah. Chef of the Year. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I don't think it was fast, personally. Um, I think just, right, perhaps. Um, I know, I because I, I, I mentioned earlier that I was getting into it much later than most. So what I did at that time was actually I, I knew that and I was cognizant of that fact. So I worked ex doubly hard. For example, while I was still in school, I was already working in like a few other places. Um, I would take on, you know, I would volunteer for certain things. So at any point in time, I had multiple things going, taking on multiple jobs just so I can maximize the time, for instance, that I was in New York and then the time that I was working. And then when I came back, my off days, I would study, I would go visit restaurants. When I'm on leave from Andre, for example, I would fly to Hong Kong, visit a friend and work for a few days in her, his or her restaurant. Things like this that, you know, you, you to help yourself parang, um, acquire more skills and at the same time, you know, see what everyone else is doing and have, you know, like a better perspective of what, what's out there. And then by the time you try to think about what you want to do, you know, you have all this at the back of your head. So it's easier. So it's that. It's, I think, working doubly hard. I don't, um, not taking shortcuts. I went through the line. I went through, you know, from, from the start of being a commie, breaking down fish, breaking down lobster, doing all the grunt work, peeling potatoes and all that. I went <laughs> through all that. I never skip a step, you know burning yourself like every night on you know on this station on that station until you know i finally was able to you know make myself seen and you know um promoted for whatever it was my contribute the contribution that i brought to the team at that point yeah so yeah i went through all that and i think 
it's important in this industry not taking shortcuts because it's to me the last known or maybe one of the remaining vestiges of you know meritocracy where you only progress as far with your talents you know you can't rely mm -hmm. on connection or anything because the proof is really in the pudding yeah right? it's, it's only as good as what you put out so yeah so don't take shortcuts work doubly hard and um i think check your ego at the door because the mm -hmm. thing the danger for most chefs is you have you're very sure about what you are what you're about what your brand is so at some point you kind of stop learning because you think oh this is how i want it to be this is already the best way you know but there's always so much to learn like it's constantly evolving so to not shut yourself off from that and just continue moving forward and improving i think it's another yeah yeah ang galing, ah. No, uh, that's very important message because sometimes, di ba, some, some students here mag-graduate lang na culinary school, parang feeling na chef na sila. But, yeah, uh, no, 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 it's, no, 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 you're right, you're right. People are in a hurry, especially now. We're so used to think being in, is things being instantaneous, di ba? So you oh, you're not, yes. yeah, you have to be patient. You have to enjoy that, enjoy that journey. In fact, at the point that you come, become, you know, like a head chef or an exec uh -huh. chef, where you think more about, you know, developing menus and things like that, you will miss cooking in the line. You will miss, you know, the work that you used to do before, not having to think about all, and worry about all these things and just focus on cooking, cooking every single day, you know. You'll miss uh -oh. that time. <laughs> all right. Ang galing nga eh. Thanks for sharing. Um, so, in the... Um, how Do you, ano ba? Do you see yourself like... um Well, uh, do you envision the next 10 years for you? What's... um uh, what's next for you, Chef Joe? <clears throat> mm, um, I have a long way to go. There is, I think, um, in as much as there is, there is, there is this recognition right now. I feel like I'm only just starting. You know, mm -hmm. there is so much more to learn. There is so much more to achieve. Um, at some point down the line, of course, I want to do. Um, I want to go through that experience of building something from the ground up. Uh, okay. Something that is, you know, the like fully, maybe um, like that's all about me, like my baby, you know, in terms of conceptualization, every single aspect of it, I'm involved. So that's one thing. Um, I also want to do something that would put the spotlight on Filipino cuisine. Yes. At the moment, I actually don't. Um, I don't cook. Filipino cuisine professionally, because of course it's mostly mm -hmm. um, European, mm -hmm. right? French. Cuisine is my training. Yes. But I think we, we always talk about the period when, you know, like Filipino cuisine will, you know, have its moment. But it doesn't, it never seems to, you know, to happen. And I don't know why. So I want to be part of that movement and want to contribute to that, to, you know, like putting the spotlight on whether it's our cuisine, our producers, or you know like just products that are from home that are really outstanding yes and um i'm curious no uh because in singapore are there a lot of filipino chefs who are on the top of the restaurant industry in singapore uh more and more now more and more now yes in fact the current head chef now of um burnt ends uh, yes. patrick uh -huh. is also filipino i think he's filipino canadian Okay. Um, another friend, um, Kurt Sombrero, who is the head chef of Meat Smith in mm -hmm. India, also Filipino. And yeah, a lot of other Filipino chefs actually that I've come across. Yes. Nice. And uh, that's good. And getting recognized for. <laughs> for... Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yes. And. Um... Thank you for sharing. Maybe just a final advice lang or word. Can you talk to the people in the industry? Um, maybe getting into the industry or, you know, having uh, problems now with the pandemic. Any message to them and any advice uh, moving forward? Mm, okay. Um, I think the advice is um, don't be afraid to take risks, especially if it's something that is close to your heart and you're really passionate about. But of course, make sure you do the due diligence, you know? You don't just jump into it blindly. 
you do your homework, you figure out, you know, <clears throat> you do a self-assessment, what you're good at, what you're really passionate about. Is there a need for it in the market? Are you good at it? You know, it's important to, to be upfront and honest with yourself about these things before actually jumping into something like this. Because it's very easy to, see, to say, follow your passion, but do you have what it takes at the end of the day to actually see it through, right? That's, I think, where most people falter. You start it, but at some way, somewhere along the way, you lose steam. So at the start, make sure that you do it with the end in mind, you know? You figure out where you want to be, and work towards that and make sure that you continue to motivate yourself or you improve yourself to such an extent that you can see that plan through. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the people will be watching uh, this um, discussion will be inspired with uh, your story. Now, uh, ako lang, curious lang, was there a point that, that you regret at the early start of your mm. career, regret leaving PNG? Or hindi talaga, all in ka at the start, uh, all the way? No, at some point, yes, of course, definitely there were like instances when I was like, why did I do this ba? What was I thinking that time? There were there are moments where you doubt and you're like, huh? I don't know, maybe I was, you know, I was not in the, you know, I was not thinking properly at that point in time. But, when I step back and look at it again, these moments when I doubt, you know, the decisions that I made, you know, I left all that behind. Like, if I just fo followed that path, I would be like, you know, a VP or a GM or whatever, right? Oh, oh but, yes, correct. No, no, I, I, I don't know, right? Like, it depends because you see your peers like progressing and doing so well, and you're like, you're happy for them, but at the same time, it does you can't help but question, right? Um, and it's during those moments that I step back and think about, okay. But do I enjoy my work? Do I still wake up in the morning like really excited about, you know, as opposed to, for example, I'm doing something else. And that is when it goes back to how you're passionate about, you know, like the passion that you had for this. And that's why you did it in the first place. Yes. Yes. Galing, galing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, hirap, hirap talaga nung starting and I'm um, so proud of you winning that thank award you, and you. I think uh, the entire Philippine nation um, ang daming nag-congratulate but I'm sure they don't know you yet and thank you for sharing uh, this uh, bit of story kasi it's really inspiring especially during this time to hear this kind of story um, you know, Filipina winning in the award and uh, I think more than that the ten-year journey, no, uh, getting to where you are, um, yeah. it's so inspiring. And um, I just remember, there's really just a few people then who would jump from a multi, lalo na ikaw, laundry BM in Singapore <laughs> in, oh, in PNG. Oh, no, but since you mentioned that, actually, speaking of, you're one of those people who actually took the risk and. Pursued your passion much, yeah, much I know. earlier than I did. <laughs> yeah. It's harder. That's why I'm, I'm, you know, I'm inspired by your story as well. Because I remember when I jump. Imagine mo when I jump PNG. Eto CIO when I jump when people ask me what do I do I was blogging. <laughs> when, when I tell them I was blogging, nakat nakatungo pa yung noo ko nun. Eh. <laughs> nobody really. <laughs> <laughs> why you were one of the pioneers, you know. You had no role models, no one to um, follow, or you know, like you know. But oh. yeah, it's that's a gutsy thing to yeah. do, I think. And uh, <laughs> and I think we're in a cycle now, no. I think in this pandemic, I know a lot of people are thinking about, you know, re reinventing themselves. Um, hmm. say they see the at least. You know, with the vaccines, people are seeing the end is near. Of, of course, not yet, you know, anytime soon. But at least you can see the light. And people mm. are starting to hope again. And mm. thank you for sharing your story. Ang galing, ah. No, no, uh, it's been an honor, of course, like talking to you and sharing, you know. Thank you for um, listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I uh, hope we can visit you in Singapore. Yes, 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 for sure, for sure. Hopefully sooner uh -oh, rather soon. than later, yes. <laughs> the borders open up again. Uh oh, 
Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Salamat, Anton. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, for watching on the live stream and on the replay.